All right. Happy Monday, everyone. Today we're talking about coin swaps, massively improving Bitcoin privacy and fungibility. A lot of excitement around coin swaps. Um, so hopefully we can, uh, you know, touch on some interesting things. Um, so yeah, this is a, a 2020 ongoing uh, uh, GitHub uh, repo uh, paper that uh, uh, Chris Belcher has been working on. Um, you can uh, view the original file here at this link. Um, and yeah, it's, it's heavily based on the 2013 work by uh, Greg Maxwell. Just a reminder of what we've been doing. Uh, Wasabi Research Club is uh, a weekly meetup that tries to focus on interesting philosophical papers, uh, math papers, privacy papers around Bitcoin. Um, so we cover different topics and you can see here we've covered a lot of uh, different topics in the last uh, few months. Um, we went on a little bit of hiatus uh, because I was mostly the one sort of organizing these things and became a lot less uh, formal in April uh, uh, and May uh, with uh, casual conversations. And most recently, uh, we're very excited to say that Wabi Sabi's, uh, uh, which was sort of the outcome of all of this uh, discussion and work, we have this new new protocol draft that's been you know just finished by um, a lot of people that are on this call. Uh, and, uh, and and that's very exciting. And so now we're kind of getting back into the into the swing of things with uh, regular discussions of paper papers. Last week we talked about coin swaps as just a broad idea, like philosophically, like what are coin swaps? Why do we want them? Um, how how are some ways we could use coin swaps, etc. Today we're looking at a specific protocol for coin swaps, which is Chris Belcher's uh, 2020 uh, paper. Excellent. Find out everything uh, about what we're doing uh, on our GitHub. Um, it's very likely we'll continue to talk about coin swaps in next Monday's presentation. So if you're enjoying coin swaps, then uh, you'll be pretty excited. Um, okay, so like any good privacy paper, uh, the coin swaps paper begins with a bit of prose. Uh, Belcher writes, imagine a future where a user Alice has bitcoins and wants to send them with maximal privacy. So she creates a special kind of transaction. For anyone looking at the blockchain, her transaction appears completely normal with her coins seemingly going from address A to address B. But in reality, her coins end up in address Z, which is entirely unconnected to either A or B. And so here, um, the big thing that Belcher is trying to talk about when he's uh, uh, bringing up his uh, coin swap sort of protocol is, 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 is a concept of uh, covertness, right? And so what is covertness? We talked about this last week, um, covertness, um, we say that a protocol is covert if a passive bystander is not able to differentiate a user of the, the protocol with a regular everyday user who is not engaged in that protocol. So for Bitcoin, this means not revealing any sort of smart contract behavior in the address format or the transaction format. Now, if what we care about is covertness, we have to admit that, that coin joins are not covert. What do we mean by that? Well. When we look at a coin join, yes, we can say, you know, uh, individuals participating in a coin join are anonymous uh, between themselves. And there's a certain uh, a sort of probabilistic uncertainty in terms of which um, blinded output belongs to which participant. Um, but there's no question to the passive observer that what's going on uh, before them is a coin join. It is these, these three individuals are engaged in some sort of privacy enhancing technique. Um, and so in that way, a, a zero link coin join is not covert, right? Uh, we, we know people who use coin join and we know people who don't use coin join and they're very distinct. So why is covertness so critical? Uh, this is brought up immediately in the paper. Um, Belcher makes a good point. He says, I imagine a completely different user, Carol, who doesn't care at all about privacy. And she sends her Bitcoin using a regular wallet, which exists today, that isn't concerned with privacy at all. But because Carol's transaction looks exactly like Alice's, and Alice does care about privacy, Alice is doing these covert uh, coin swaps, Carol's transaction is now uh, possibly um, Alice's transaction. It, you, you can't be certain that Carol herself is not engaged in some privacy protocol because it looks just like Alice. So Carol's privacy is improved even though she didn't change her behavior and perhaps had never even heard of the software. So she, she, she doesn't care at all about coin swaps, but because Alice is engaged in these covert uh, privacy protocols, she's actually shielding Carol as well. This is a pretty huge property and CoinJoin 
in a sense, does offer this property uh, in a very small amount because if CoinJoin participants are engaged with average uh, everyday users, those average everyday users are getting um, uh, uh, very, very obfuscated coins. And so when they then give those obfuscated coins to other users, uh, obfuscated coins become sort of everywhere. But here, this is uh, quite a bit uh, further, I think. So uh, what do we mean by covertness in, the, uh, um, you know, in light of uh, coin swaps? We mean that uh, if you have uh, Alice in orange and Bob in yellow, that what they're doing when they're doing a coin swap between each other is they're sending their addresses to uh, a special uh, address that looks like uh, uh, your average, um, uh, you know, plain pay to public key hash address or pay to witness public key hash address. And then from that address, uh, they are switching ownership uh, for, from one to the other. And the critical thing here is that on the blockchain, these two uh, graphs uh, of, of, you know, Alice's coin going to this uh, brown address and then to, to yellow address is completely un unconnected. There's no merging of the graphs from these two sides. So they're completely separate graphs. And so uh, no one knows that this is happening. And so uh, the end result is that whatever Bob's history is, now Alice is, Alice is inheriting it. So if Bob is a, uh, is a British individual who likes to buy you know, uh, shoes online, his history is now going over to, to Alice, who uh, is then going to uh, behave totally differently. And any forensics company that's trying to cluster those behaviors and is trying to, to say, you know, this graph looks clearly like Bob will, will then be met with a completely different user behavior because actually it's Alice. So this is totally covert. That's what's going on here. So um, here is Belcher talking about um, uh, coin swaps in the very beginning. You can see he outlines it very clearly here uh, on the bottom, the same uh, sort of chart that I've, uh, you know, that, that was on a previous slide. Um, and uh, the critical thing to understand, of course, is that coin swaps are non-custodial, which means that, you know, Alice is not giving her coin up to Bob, um, hoping that Bob doesn't steal that coin. Uh, no, they're using uh, uh, hash time lock contracts and, and the like to guarantee that as soon as Bob claims uh, uh, Alice's coin, Alice is now able to claim Bob's coin. Uh, this is not uh, very different from uh, the Lightning Network um, that we've seen. Um, and again, like I said before, this is heavily based on the 2013 pr protocol by Gregory Maxwell, although back then Maxwell had to use many more transactions and they, were, uh, they, they weren't covert at all. Um, it, it was quite evident, uh, at, at least that something fishy was going on, that this transaction was different than an average transaction. Um, and this is not the case with, with, with Belcher's work. So how is Belcher making it covert? I mean, if Maxwell couldn't make it covert, how, how is Belcher doing that? Well, he's using a clever trick called uh, ECDSA 2P. This is two-party elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So what essentially what it is, is a two of two multi-signature address, but it looks the same as a regular single signature address. And any address can be, uh, can be, uh, can be converted into a two-party elliptic curve, uh, uh, a two-party ECDSA. So you can use it with pay to public key hash, you can use it with uh, pay to script hash uh, uh, wrapped pay to witness public key hash, or you can use it with the new BEC32 pay to uh, witness public key hash. Um, and there's a big uh, point that Belcher makes here, which is uh, which uh, shows a lot of, of where he comes from, because um, I haven't said a lot about, about Chris Belcher because everyone in this chat knows something about him. He is the privacy wiki maintainer. He is the uh, Electrum personal server maintainer. He is the join market maintainer. So he, he's probably one of the top three people in the space working on privacy. And um, you, you can see that uh, uh, something very smart in what he says here. He says, you know, although Schnorr signatures with MuSig provide a much easier way to in create invisible two of two multi-sig, it is not as suitable for coin swap. And you might ask why would a more secure uh, um, you know, s simpler protocol that's, uh, um, you know, that, that, uh, um, uh, that all the, that all the new hype is, is talking about. Why isn't that the way that Belcher wants to go? And the answer is simple because not enough people are using this address. And what Belcher really wants is he wants users who are using CoinSwap to look like an overwhelming majority of average people on the network. So he wants people to look like just everyday, 
old school pay to public key hash or the newer pay to scripts hash wrapped in pay to win public key hash. Um, he doesn't want to use a, um, the, the, a new format that, that is a very small number of people. Um, and so the, the, the property of covertness that's really important here is, is the one that I've sort of highlighted here in, in, in green. It's these special addresses, right? These special addresses, um, we need a two of two multisig, but we don't want to reveal that it's a two of two multisig because two of two multisigs uh, comprise of a super minority of uh, both Bitcoin amounts and Bitcoin addresses on the network. So what we would like to do is we would like to look like any any wallet, blockchain.com wallet. We want to look like, you know, Wasabi wallet. We want to look like Mycelium wallet. We want to look like Coinomi wallet. We want to look like every other common wallet. And none of those wallets are offering two of two multisig because that's quite rare. So, um, so, so, uh, so he, he solved this with, with a two-party ECDSA. Uh, the, the second thing we have to ask is, well, how are we going to avoid amount correlation? Because the, the, the problem you have is that if an adversary starts tracking an address of Alice at point A, they could unmix the coin swap easily by searching the entire blockchain for other transactions with amounts close to the amount that Alice is using. If, if it's 15 Bitcoin, then uh, you know that forensics company is simply going to watch for other addresses that are doing transactions with exactly 15 Bitcoin, which would lead them to, uh, to address Alice B. We can beat this by amount correlation attack by creating multi-transaction coin swaps. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Instead of Alice, you know, at the top, Alice is going to swap with Bob. So she's going to have her 30 Bitcoins. She's going to swap it over to Bob, who's going to receive the 30 Bitcoins. But Bob isn't going to give Alice a single UTXO. Instead, Bob is going to give Alice a cluster of UTXOs uh, that amount to 30 Bitcoins. Um, as you can see here, um, um, now we're introducing not a single um, coin swap, but, but, but a triple uh, coin swap, multi, multi-coin coin swap here. Uh, and the net result is that it's much, much harder for anyone on the outside to find, um, you know, those uh, those UTXOs that amount to 30, um, especially if Alice herself doesn't have a single UTXO, but, but several UTXOs that she's exchanging for other UTXOs. As it turns out with this protocol, there are no limitations with um, both uh, uh, merging UTXOs in a coin swap, but also branching UTXOs in a coin swap. So you really don't know if, if Alice is getting one UTXO, two UTXOs, or 12 UTXOs. So that's how uh, uh, Belger proposes that we prevent amount correlation. Um, now let's talk about trustlessness. Okay, so we talked about covertness. Let's talk about trustlessness. A protocol is trustless if it neither jeopardizes the security nor the privacy of the user's uh, Bitcoin and their Bitcoin history to any single party. Now, the coin joins we've talked about in the past, in particular, zero link coin joins are trustless. Specifically, zero link Chalian blind coin joins are trustless because the users do not give the central coordinator any additional information about their addresses. Now, um, there are other protocols that don't uh, do these, this, this, this blinding, and that, of course, is not trustless. But with, with the zero-link coin join, they are trustless. And, of course, zero-link coin joins um, rely on the users having to sign the transactions. So if a user believes they're being screwed over and, and do not get the amount of Bitcoin they deserve back, they simply don't sign, and there's no risk to the user of losing Bitcoins. But coin swaps are not trustless by default. It's not the security of the, of the, of the Bitcoin that's of a concern. It's the privacy of the Bitcoin. And why is that? Well, it should be quite evident. Whenever you do a coin swap, you are engaging with one other individual. And so how do you know that one other individual isn't Chainalysis or some forensics company? And how do you know that individual isn't going to comply or, or collude with a bad actor? So uh, clearly, you don't know if the person you're, you're, you're collaborating with is going to rat you out because they know uh, your history of coins. So how does... Um, Belcher deal with this problem? Well, he introduces this idea of routing coin swaps. Now, this, this diagram here isn't very accurate. Uh, there's a more accurate diagram in, in a second, but the idea is, is sort of there. So here, what you can imagine is three participants are doing coin swaps between each other. First, Alice is doing it with Bob, and then, Al and then uh, with Bob's coin, Alice is doing it with Carol, and then finally with Carol's coin, she receives that back. Um, and so the idea here is that coins are bouncing around from multiple participants. 
such that yes, one participant can 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 know a particular link, but uh, in order for uh, Alice's coin to be de-anonymized, all of the participants in, in, in this coin swap must collude together to de-anonymize her. And it, it, if this is starting to sound very similar, it's because this sounds almost exactly like Lightning or Tor. Um, uh, the fact that we're onion routing, we're essentially doing this multiple times with multiple participants so that uh, every participant is just one link to, to the final destination, this is actually um, uh, very secure. Here's a better diagram. So. Um, you can imagine that on the left is Alice's coin and she's switching it for the brown coin. And now she has that brown coin, she switches it for a blue coin. And then she has a blue coin, she switches it for a green coin. And then she finally switches it for one last coin. And that is the coin she's deciding to spend from now on. And the important thing is that all of these links need to be broken in order for her privacy to be broken. And so brown, blue, and green must collude together to break her privacy. So if Alice wants to avoid trusting Bob or Carol or Dan, she can trust None of them by essentially trusting a little, uh, all of them. And as long as all of them don't collude in a conjunction format, that is they all collude together, um, she's pretty much okay. So then uh, um, we, we have to combine these two concepts together. So um, in, in the paper, um, uh, Belcher uh, has this drawing here where Alice has her multiple coins. She's s s s switch, uh, swapping them with Bob's multiple coins. Um, and then she has Bob's multiple coins and she's swapping it with Charlie. And then she has Charlie's coin, she's swapping it with Dennis and so forth until she's ready to spend those coins. And the, the graph is completely broken and Alice has not trusted Bob or Charlie or Dennis and the amount correlation is very hard to perform. Here's a slightly better diagram, I think, than the one that, that Belcher gave, just because he was sort of constrained. You know, again, you just have these uh, these coin swaps for different coins of the same total amounts, and these coin swaps continue uh, sort of indefinitely. Now, um, Belcher does make a point that most people will trust one swap. And I think that's kind of an interesting point that he makes, that most users will, will trust one or two swaps and won't need to do many, many swaps. Um, I don't know if it's a particularly sound thing to to suggest because it does um, present problems with um, with uh, motivated actors um, performing a civil attack. Although he addresses that later on. Um, so here's another diagram. Uh, he also talks about what happens if Alice has a single UTXO of 15 Bitcoin. Well, Alice will need to do a, a branching coin swap where she doesn't swap for a single coin. Rather, she swaps for uh, six of Bob's coins. And then those coins are then swapped for Charlie's coins and Dennis's coins. And they actually are swapped at different times with different participants. So not all 15 coins are going in the same, uh, uh, going in the same path. They're actually branching out to different uh, uh, individuals altogether. So it makes uh, timing and, and, and amount correlation very, very hard. And so at the end, Alice ends with a bunch of coins from you know, Edward and from Fred. And then if Alice has two large coins and she needs to consolidate them, but she doesn't want the, the histories of those two coins to be merged, she can again do the same thing by switching them from Bob and Charlie's coins and then finally merging those coins together because Bob and Charlie's histories are less critical um, than Alice's history. Um, so, uh, so, so something interesting here. So, so now um, Belcher is talking about breaking change output and wallet fingerprinting heuristics. The, the, the first thing we should talk about is, is the breaking the change output. So equal output coin joins easily leak change addresses unless they are, are sweeps with no change, right? So we know that, that, that any equal uh, output coin join has this problem where there's some change and that change is, is, is what we call um, toxic. Um, so this isn't a problem for coin swap because any Bitcoin that you have, you uh, can find a, a maker, uh, an individual who has Bitcoins, who is willing to match your amount in exchange for some, some fee. Um, so co coin swap doesn't have that, that change output uh, heuristic. Um, uh, and this brings up to the next point, which is the wallet fingerprinting. Heuristic, and here I put in brackets the concept of randomness. So I'm just going to say a little bit of a personal story, which hopefully I can put up on um, on. Hopefully I can put this on uh, um, um, 
uh, Belcher is a privacy wiki, but uh, um, BTC Pay Server um, has a interesting uh, um, a transaction output ordering for inputs. So when when uh, when BTC Pay Server uh, when, when you use the BTC Pay Server wallet and you send money from within BTC Pay Server, uh, what it will do is it will sort of randomly organize the inputs. Um, so typically, when you look at uh, uh, you know businesses that get a lot of uh, inputs, uh, get, um, get a lot of coins into their business, when they want to spend, typically businesses will either order uh, by amount, whether it's reverse ordering or uh, you know high to low or low to high, or they will order by time that the Bitcoin has arrived in the wallet. But BTC Pay Server didn't do that. They decided to do it randomly. So um, they took all their inputs and, they, and, and, and you know, it, it's just random. It's not by time. It's not by amount. Now, you might think, wow, this is brilliant. You know, we'll use randomness. And, and now BTC Pay Server um, doesn't, you know, you know, add some privacy to, to the merchants that use that service. Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's the opposite of reality because very few people use randomness. And so the result is that randomness is a fingerprint. So, uh, uh, you know, Belcher pointed this out, and it's, it's a very good point. He, he brings it up here. He says, we can break this heuristic by having makers randomly, with some probability, send their change to an address they've used before. He's talking here about a different heuristic, um, about the heuristic of um, uh, um, ad uh, addresses being reused are likely payment addresses. You know, uh, for example, I want to pay you money, and I'm likely to reuse your address. Um, but change addresses are always brand new. He's saying, well, why don't we just have a small probability of change addresses being reused on purpose? And again, some people might say, well, don't, shouldn't we never reuse an address? Well, actually, what Belcher's saying is, is totally correct. Um, we should be uh, behaving like the crowd um, so that forensics companies cannot say anything probabilistic or statistically about our particular protocol. Uh, and actually, Wasabi did a very similar thing. I think Wasabi did this about RBF recently, like or a few months ago, where we found out that, you know, there was like something like 7% of BEC32 uh, spends have RBF enabled. So we just uh, we just made it so that Wasabi wallets have like 7% of the time Wasabi uh, transactions have RBF. So it's purposefully... Um, it's not random. It, 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 it's, 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 it's looking similar to what other uh, people are doing. So another great heuristic he, he attacks is the script type heuristic. He says, why don't we just purposefully um, um, make the address address format we use just look like the address format um, of, of, of the rest of the network? And this is also uh, quite, quite clever, although there's some downside of not using the most efficient address format because that results in higher fees. Um, so th th there was a lot of other other things to talk about um, in, uh, in in this paper, and I think it it, it, it likely merits a, a, a part two um, series. Uh, I, I was hoping Belcher is here. I don't know if he's currently here. Are, are, are you there, Chris? No. Okay. So um, I was hoping to have to have him on here and and and. And answer some some questions so far, but why don't we leave it there for now? And uh, yeah, questions, comments. How about so? What what, what do you think? What should be the end? Because based on that, you know, coin joins and no coin stops and. Uh, there isn't anything else much more. What should be the end goal of Bitcoin privacy? Uh, the end user experience. Could you describe it? You're asking me, right? So I, I can describe you what I think the end user experience of CoinJoin could be, uh, which is actually two which is very small uh, join market coin joins, two of two coin joins, and, and that would, would result in every transaction being a coin join. So so that, that's one, and that would be as instant as it can be. Uh, however, there is another one where large coin joins provides a lot of privacy, but it would take like a couple of, a couple of, like a 20, or 40 or, or one hour uh, time 
for you to, to be open open your wallet and and then you can spend your coins so so what what how would it look like with coin swaps in mind well I, if max is on the line then i'm sure he can jump in and start to say what his end goal is max <laughs> is anyone even here other than us? Okay, well, um, yeah, it's a good question. I think the problem with coin swaps alone is um, you still, uh, the, the, the way I see the privacy and anonymity networks is you're trying to smell user behavior and figure out where users are. And so um, I don't see like a one solution fits all where everything is just solved now. Um, um, uh, you still have privacy problems. You know, for example, like let's say you're just a merchant um, and you know, um, you're getting all these payments from people that are doing these coin swaps. So yeah, like the graph is really obfuscated, but now you have all these payments. What do you do? I think for a lot of large business cases and large users, I think um, CoinJoin still is the most effective because it, it, it just it just crushes the, um, the graph. It, it makes the graph incredibly hard to, to unravel. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Uh, go ahead. No, I, I, I would actually really like to hear uh, some, some, someone else uh, talk as well. Uh, just because I'm not familiar with the different wallets, fingerprints, uh, what kind of things left leaves these? I mean, Oh, I can talk about that. I, Sorry? I, yeah, I can talk about that uh, in depth. I actually, uh, I, I fingerprint a lot of wallets. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I actually can look at the blockchain with pretty good accuracy and figure out which, which user is using which, which wallet. Um, I mean, it's, it's everything, right? So, so uh, you, know, uh, you know, when, when I see a transaction on the blockchain, what kind of address format? Okay, that's an easy one. What kind of, uh, is the change address a BIP69? Is it indexed lexicographically or is it just randomly indexed? Okay, that gives something away. What's the lock time? Is it zero or is it a recent block? What's the end sequence? Um, you know, uh, what's the version number of that transaction? Um, is the change address reused like blockchain.com? Okay, that's easy one. You know, that, that, you know that's the case. Um, uh, sometimes I notice that a wallet will uh, pay to like type outputs. Okay, bingo. Only a couple of, of, of wallets offer that, that advanced feature. Um, so I immediately know, know what's, what's going on. Um, you know, all of these things, like it's, it, it becomes quickly, it becomes, oh, here's a good, good one. The transaction fee, what kind of number is it? Is it a whole number or is it a partial number? Is it, uh, when I look at the blockchain at, at that time, is it, is it based on Electrum's um, of, um, fee distribution or Bitcoin Core's fee distribution? Is it based on, um, you know, does the user get to manually pick or are there three base options? You know, these are pr things that are pretty quickly revealed. Um, there are probably like 20 to 30 qualities of a transaction. And the problem with having a lot of qualities is that if you repeat qualities, you become a snowflake, which means you become unique, right? No other wallet is going to have the same 20 qualities that you do. Um, and so for that reason, um, uh, someone like me, I, I have a pretty easy time like uh, like deciphering um uh, you know, transactions li literally to which wallet was based on, on nothing but, but, but one transaction. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah, thanks for clearing that out. And also the transaction graph that, that could, well, if, if everything else fails, then that gives the final clue of what happened here. <laughs> 